service for this first Sunday uh, after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic scare across the world, I guess. But uh, we're going to start our services today with the, the song Blessed Assurance. If you haven't had one of our hymn books, it's song number 51. If not, we've got the words projected here on the screen behind me. Sing that with me, Blessed Assurance. other up in prayer for each other and uh, keep our families uh, uh, kind of in the in the routine and I hate to use that word routine we don't want to be in a routine but we want to be in a place where uh, we come together and meet with the Lord and and uh, worship him and you can worship him in your home and I trust that this morning uh, it was a blessing to you I believe tonight we'll be blessed uh, as we hear from God's word and as we sing uh, a little bit more music and uh, just remind ourselves of what a great God that we serve and who he is and how much he loves us. So let me give you a couple of announcements uh, tonight. Uh, I was just going to bring up the matter of FBI registration, Faith Bible Institute. Uh, we're kind of on hold with that and we'll figure out a little more. We still know Faith Bible Institute tomorrow night uh, because of this. And then we will determine, uh, <clears throat> waiting on Pastor Yates to kind of tell us what he's going to do. But I wanted to let you know that the fall registration, uh, which begins about the third week of August uh, for the fall semester, is uh, this month is uh, the best price you can get on it. In fact, I was online yesterday, and uh, you can kind of get registered for $25, but it does save you uh, a good piece of money if you'll go ahead and register uh, at this time. So I just wanted to encourage you to do that. You can get it, find that place where you can register online at fbiclass.com. And if you'll go down that page, you'll find some instructions about how to do that. Also wanted to uh, pray for the Ellicott Baptist School. And uh, we are on spring break beginning tomorrow. 
and so no classes this week and we've kind of sent the, the uh, materials home last week for the kids to finish up and uh, probably we'll be being in contact with the families uh, here this week to kind of touch base with price and break a brother Craig as he uh, puts those things together and gets that going. I also wanted to mention to you that uh, Brother Jeff uh, is, has posted a link on the Facebook page um, and it's about, it's an independent Baptist pastor in Kentucky that is speaking about this, uh, this shutdown here. And I see, you see it there, the coronavirus shutdown. I was very helpful. He went back and did a lot of research on the Spanish flu of 1918 and showed that, you know, we've never experienced this before, never been in this place, but our country has, and there has been a time where even churches did not meet. They voluntarily chose to, to stop meeting because of a pandemic. And so that's kind of what I believe our government is trying to do right now to keep this thing, get it to level out and not to spread. And so we're gonna do our best to be good about that. And, but we also want to, we have an opportunity they did not have back then. And that is that we can <laughs> gather together, preach to you the word of God and sing together and kind of have a digital uh, time where we can fellowship together. So we're going to be doing that. It was kind of interesting this morning after we finished, we, I went over to the office and there was a phone call. And I thought, well, I better answer that. I gave out my phone number uh, on the uh, live stream this morning. And lo and behold, it was a uh, pastor, Ajay, uh, calling me from India to say that he appreciated the invitation to uh, come and tune into our page. And uh, we, he was, wasn't a great connection and I had a hard time a little bit. Uh, I think we were not communicating, we were kind of a pause between our communications at times. But I did, uh, he said, you know, to remember them in prayer. He's a pastor of the Baptist church over there. And uh, they also are having the coronavirus going on in India. And he said to pray for his country, especially in the area where he was at. He also has a wife that is pregnant and uh, she's eight months pregnant. And so we're going to pray for the Ajay family. If you think about them there, serving the Lord in India and so I'd like to encourage you to do that so let me one more thing I don't want to lose this because this uh, happened kind of right in the middle of our memory verse we're just about done with our memory verses and we're been memorizing 1st Corinthians chapter 13 we're down to uh, the last three verses and so tonight I'd like to uh, have you read with me if you will or if you can you quote with me in unison, we're going to do the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And I may have to scan down here on my Bible, but I think I'm doing okay. But I get a little nervous. Even though you're not here, I know you're there. And <laughs> you still make me nervous, all right? So here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels... And have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long in his time. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, 
but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know also, even as I am known. Now, now by faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Amen. All right, we'll keep working on those and uh, get those verses together. We're going to kind of continue on what we do on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. We're going to read a missions letter. And so Brother Jeff Walbach is going to come tonight. mission letter tonight is from the Michael Lee family. It says, hello from El Quinche, Ecuador. I hope this letter finds you well and blessed by the Lord. Our family had a wonderful celebration of Christ's birth and of the new year. I'm looking forward to what the Lord will do this year here in Ecuador. Our school book project has been going very well. The Christian-based textbook has been well received by the schools where we have presented it. We have passed out a total of 1,700 books to each student in four different schools so far, and have even been able to talk to the students and give them a few words from the Bible. We have several schools lined up to receive the next printing of books. We are very grateful for the following five churches who together have given $13,000 to print more books. Badger Road Baptist Church, Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, Bible Baptist Church, Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, and Mission Boulevard Baptist Church. I have been waiting to print because if we spend $16,000, the printer will print the books for $2 each instead of $2.50. Please pray with me for this because there is a difference of 1,600 books. This would mean we could reach three more schools with that discount. I have been able to start a Bible study with my new family Mauricio and his family visited the mission here in El Quinche, and we have been getting together to study the Bible. We have been going through the Bible correspondence courses, which start with knowing God personally. It is a big blessing to know with 100% assurance that you are saved and going to heaven. The Bible has answers to every question, so many of the family's questions are being answered, and topics that have been fuzzy for them are being cleared up and understood completely. It is exciting to see them grow in knowledge. The mission here in El Quinche has moved to a new location. Our former landlord refused to fix some structural damage and said he wanted our auditorium to put it into a bread store. This was of the Lord since we are now at a larger facility and we pay less rent. We are also in a more residential area and are excited to reach out to our new neighbors. Our investment in new recording equipment has been a blessing allowing us to reach more people through the internet. The preaching portion of our Sunday and Wednesday services is recorded and shared on YouTube, Facebook, and WhatsApp. Through this ministry, we are now reaching over 30 people who do not attend our services or only visit occasionally. I'm excited about our new project of recording the Bible correspondence studies, which allow us to offer Bible study to people who are not interested in or able to come to a service but would like to know more about the Bible. We appreciate your prayers and support. May God continue to bless you in your service to him. In Christ, Michael Lee and family. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Dear Father, Lord, tonight we, we thank you for the missionaries who are willing to go when you call them. And Lord, we just pray for the Michael Lee family. We think of the blessing with the new auditorium, larger, new neighbors, able to reach more people. Father, we just ask you to, to give them the wisdom and the help to go forward and, and greet those neighbors. And Lord, we think of the, the money needed to be raised. Lord, just a little bit more money, $3,000, and they'll be able, Lord, to, to reach some more students with your word. And Father, we just ask you tonight for the other missionaries around the world as well. Lord, they have so many needs. They have financial needs, physical needs, spiritual needs. Lord, we just pray that by your will, these needs are met. And Lord, if there's, a, if there's a part that we can have in meeting those needs, we ask you to show us, Father. And Lord, tonight as we gather together to share your word and have a service here to bring you glory, we just ask that you meet with us. And Lord, we just pray that everything we do here brings you the honor and glory. We, we ask you to remove all the distractions from Pastor and, and Brother Bryce and Brother Craig as they preach this week. And, Lord, we would just ask that you, you, you put a hedge of protection around them and, 
not just these these men of God right here, Lord, but the other pastors throughout the United States, throughout the world, Lord. There's nothing more that the devil hates than when a man preaches the true word of God. We just ask that these men are protected, Father. And Lord, we just pray tonight that everything we do brings you the honor and glory. And Lord, we think of the needs that we have. We have several needs tonight, Lord. We have this coronavirus. There's many people who are sick tonight with it. And there's many others who have fear that, Lord, they may have it. And Lord, it's impacting all of our lives. It's impacting everything we do. But Lord, we just ask if there's a way that we can, we can get more of the gospel out at this time, Lord. While many live in fear, there is hope. I know there's hope. You've shown that hope in my life. And Lord, we just ask you to, to protect us from that virus, Lord, and, and just to, you know, heal us and get rid of it when it's your will. Lord, tonight we ask you to, to watch over Brother Craig's family. They, they've had a loss in their family. And Lord, we just pray that through this loss, it could be a time that some come to know you as their Savior. And Father, we think of Kim tonight. And Lord, we pray. It's a, a time where she's going through cancer treatment. And Lord, she's such a blessing with her, her spirit and her wanting to show us you through her life. And Lord, I just pray that you would protect her as this virus goes and her immune system. Lord, we just thank you for the testimony she brings to this. And we think of Miss W and Joanne tonight. And we just ask you, that, Lord, to touch their lives and continue to heal them in the way that you can. Lord, we love you. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to sing another hymn, so I'd ask that you join in with me. Uh, if I got to thinking about today the turmoil in our world. But uh, you know the foundations of the Lord, they stand sure. And we serve the same God today that we served last week when we lifted up our voice together as a congregation. And so we're going to sing this song, How Firm a Foundation, just thinking about how good God is to us. So join in with me in singing that. Sunday nights, and I, I believe that the Lord just would like me to finish what He told me to start. So that's what we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and do uh, here for the next couple of weeks. We're just gonna finish out the parables that we've been going through, and um, hopefully the uh, the Word of God will continue to uh, make an impact in your heart and in your life, though you're away, that you're at home. I'm, I'm glad. I really am encouraged 
to know that it's a tendency, it would be a huge tendency for most preachers to uh, take an opportunity such as this to go ahead and, and just lay back, relax, and say, you know what, we're not going to be too concerned about preaching the Word of God, and we're not going to do any of that kind of stuff, we're just going to wait this thing out. And I'm glad we have technology to be able to do such a thing as this, but I'm also thankful for a church where that the Word of God is the focus, and that we desire to hear from the Word of God. And and I'll tell you, the Word of God can still and will continue to be a blessing to your heart with it being preached, even with you being at home. And yeah. he'll, he'll continue to do that. He'll speak to your heart, and he'll, he'll make an impact, because I'm telling you, the Word of God it will never change. And it'll it's always, amazing. always be the same, no matter what's going on in the world. Yeah. We're so thankful for that. Well, our parable tonight is going gonna, is gonna to be entitled, Forgiveness Known Should Be Forgiveness Shown. Forgiveness known should be forgiveness known. And that directly comes from the passage of Scripture, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 20, uh, 35. And so if you will go ahead and begin reading with me there, it says, Then came Peter to him, speaking of Jesus, came to Jesus, and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take, a, take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, get have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and laid his hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told him to their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord... After that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And Jesus concludes this parable by saying, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts Forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Tonight's message, as I said, is simply entitled Forgiveness Known is or Should Be Forgiveness Shown or No Shown. Forgiveness Known Should Be Forgiveness Shown. And real quick, I, I, I believe that I, I I'm in agreement with most people, and you would like likely be in agreement with me when I say that I don't think many of us enjoy receiving false information. We don't like that. You know, like being told what, whether something is, is true and it actually not be true, or, or given information that just is, is not correct altogether. We don't enjoy that. We don't like that. We don't like that. We feel deceived in some way, like we think, feel lied to. And one humorous situation that I can recall back in, when I was in Bible college was an occasion when I was a freshman. And when I was a freshman there at Bible college, I was real nervous about classes and tests and quizzes. Man, I was real nervous about those things because I, I had no idea what to expect. It was far different from public school, which I was accustomed to, but the tests were different, the quizzes were different, how to study for them were all different. I was real nervous. And we had our first big test coming up, our midterm exam. And it was over a class that I didn't feel very comfortable about either. And so I remember getting prepared and worrying about this particular test the entire week. And the night before, I come into my room after I had finished working, and I'm getting, in my mind, I'm already thinking, I need to start studying for this test. I'm nervous. I'm, I'm anxious about this thing. I don't know how it's going to go. And so that was my idea. I was going to study the entire night on this particular test. Well, just so happens, one of my roommates was in that same class as me, and I walk into the room, and he's just laid back, and he's relaxed, and he's calm as, as could be. He's calm and collected. And I asked him, I said, don't you know we have a test tomorrow? Why aren't you studying for this thing? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. I've got a, I've got a study guide that I made, and everything on this study guide is going to be on that test. And I said, 
well, can I get one of those? He said, yeah, sure. So I, I thought I had found the golden ticket, and I thought this is it. And so I started studying that, that, mid, or that study guide. I knew that thing frontwards and backwards completely. Ne the next day comes around. I go into the classroom. I sit down, have my pen ready. The, the test is passed out. And after I had written my name, I realized that no other blank I could fill in because I had no idea what any of this stuff was. Everything that I had studied for on that study or that study guide was not on that test. And I'll tell you, I, I, almost the entire test consisted of questions that did not come at all from that study guide. So I knew the study guide, but I had no idea what the test was. Now, ironically, that uh, that student, that that, that uh, roommate that I had, he received an A. I received an F on that particular test. So, um, needless to say, I started making my own study guides from then on out. I didn't, I didn't trust anybody else. And I'll tell you, whenever we receive false information, our tendency is to no longer trust that individual. But I'll tell you this, there's one place that we can go to, no matter what, and we'll never receive false information. And that's the Word of God. Amen. We know that. We, we, can, we can lay our lives down, our hearts, our, our faith, our future, whatever it may be, on the Word of God and know that it's 100% true. It will always be 100% true. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to like the answers that we receive from the Word of God every single time. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult, hard to swallow. And I imagine that's exactly the same situation that Peter was in here in this passage of Scripture. Where that he knew the place that he needed to go to for a particular question was Jesus Christ. And he comes to Jesus Christ about a particular dilemma that was going on in his life. I don't know exactly what prompted this question or what it may be, but he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, Jesus, how often should I forgive my brother? And he comes up with a particular number in mind. He says seven times. Now, I, I believe that there were some things leading up to this, uh, this question that maybe even prompted Peter to ask this particular question. If you notice... Within verses 15 and 19, Jesus is talking, is talking about what we consider how to deal with church discipline and how to deal with individuals in the church that, that are causing problems or even causing, uh, I guess, difficult uh, things happens. You need to go ahead and you need to talk to that individual. And if that doesn't work, bring a couple of other people alongside of you to go and talk to that individual. And still, if they have yet to repent or turn from their trespasses, then you bring the matter to the church. Now, when Jesus was giving this information and giving this method of church discipline, it was very clear that the intention of doing so was so that that individual, the one that was causing the trespass, would in fact repent and turn from their sin. But at the same time, though it's not explicitly uh, instructed, it is implied, though, that when that individual does turn from their trespass, the one that is being trespassed upon or, or the one that is being sinned against would forgive that individual as well, all right? And so I believe that that might be what, what prompted this question from Peter because he comes to Jesus and he says, well, Jesus, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? I don't know what caused Peter to come up with that number, it could be the fact that seven is the number of completion, so therefore, after the number seven, your forgiveness is complete, and you're done. I have no idea what the case may have been, why he asked Jesus that particular question, or that particular number. But I feel like we could really relate to Peter in this position, because I believe that we've all been in situations where that we've had people come to us and, and cause problems, or cause uh, difficult situations and tensions between us, and we don't, we don't like those situations, we don't like when people cause problems with us, when they sin against us, when they tras trespass against us. And, and mind you, we understand it's not some novel idea that I'm presenting here that we're required to, to forgive. I mean, that's something that is required within the Word of God all throughout Scriptures. It's not something new that we've heard before. But I'll tell you this, it's really, really difficult to forgive somebody over and over and over again, repeatedly. And notice the question that Peter asks to Jesus indicates that whatever was going on may have happened or occurred multiple times. Because he asked Jesus seven times, is that how often I should forgive a person? And I believe we can relate to that, where that we think, man, I've had to deal with this particular person 
or this situation that they keep bringing up and the same problem, the same sin. They keep doing this one thing to me over and over and over again. And we can almost justify our lack of forgiveness by saying, well, Jesus, God, you know, it's, I mean, come on. How many times will I have to forgive this individual? I mean, it's, it's not like there's any indication that they're going to turn from it, that they're actually actually going to stop doing what they're doing, Jesus. So how often do I have to forgive them? We could ask the same question multiple times. But unfortunately, we don't ever have a right to withhold forgiveness from a person that seeks it. Because as you notice in verse number 22, Jesus responds to Peter's answer or question by saying, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, until seventy times seven, Peter. Seventy times seven times. And, and look, I know that we all know it's not that Jesus was asking Peter to get a notebook out and to write down every offense that a person does against you. And when they have reached the number of 490 times, then you can stop forgiving. It's not like Jesus was, was trying to hire the standard in terms of the number of times you forgive a person. He's actually hiring the standard as to why you should forgive a person. Okay? And so, when Jesus tells him 40, 490 times, 70 times, 7 times... We could have stopped right there and, and understood that Jesus is saying, look, Peter, you need to be willing to forgive people an unlimited amount of times. You should have unlimited forgiveness. And, and really, we could have concluded that that could have concluded this interaction between Jesus and Peter right here, then and there. But it doesn't. Because like I said, Jesus, look, here's the thing. Jesus knows, and I love this, not so much in my own life all the time. But I love the fact that Jesus knows our hearts, and he knows exactly what question we need answered. Not that we want answered, but that we need answered. See, Peter didn't need to be answered how many times he should forgive a person. He needed answered why he should be willing to forgive. Because if he knew why he should be willing to forgive, he wouldn't have a problem with forgiving people an unlimited amount of times and be willing to forgive people unconditionally. And so that's what prompted this very parable that Jesus presents here. He starts off the, the parable by giving it a, a story about a man. But I guess this man, it's indicated that this man is a king of some sort. He holds a large portion, a large nation. He's a ruler of a nation. And so therefore, because of that, there, there are going to be uh, some things that need to be set up and structured properly, such as taxes. And so this king has individual servants that would be responsible of collecting taxes in different portions of the land or the nation. So he'll have one servant collecting taxes in this portion and this portion and so on and so forth. And so the objective then was for the king to only have to one time a year go to each and every one of those servants and collect the taxes that they had collected and use those, that money, that currency for whatever reason he saw fit. He was a good king, he used it for the prosperity of the kingdom or for the nation. If he was a bad king, he would use it for his own selfish ambitions. But nevertheless, that's not the point. We see here that as this king is going around and collecting taxes from each of these individual uh, servants, he comes to one of them who had failed to collect taxes for whatever reason. It's not depicted for us, it's not prescribed as to why this servant, what we call, who we call the wicked servant, as to why he did not uh, collect the taxes. It could have been that he was, he was using the money for himself. He was stealing it. It could have been that he was just slothful, that he did never, so, so to speak, clock in to work, that he really just didn't do much of anything, that he wasn't diligent to do the job that was required of him. Whatever the case may be, he didn't do it. So much so that the king, or he owed the king, he should have uh, collected a total amount in which, in which he did owe the king because he failed to do so, 1,000 uh, talents worth. Now, I, I did a little bit of research on this, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say it's definitively true, but there are many sources that have said that that is equivalent to $16 million in today's day and age. $16 million. And mind you, this took place back in the biblical era. So that, that amount of money would have been almost unfathomable for most people. They would have heard this and thought, man, that's almost unimaginable. That amount of money, we've never, we can't even imagine that amount of money. And there's a particular reason for that, and we'll get to that. But here's the thing. He owed that much to the king. And so the king said, look, since you didn't do the job that was required of you, because whether you were using it for your own self, you were stealing it, or whether you were not just doing the job altogether, look, you owe me that money. 
You were supposed to do the job. You're supposed to collect the taxes, but you failed to do so. So you owe that to me. And because obviously you can't pay that off right now, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring judgment upon you. You're gonna receive the consequences for this, but at the same time, so that I can get something out of this exchange. And so therefore, you're gonna have yourself sold, your whole family, and everything that you owe is gonna be sold. Now, think about this wicked servant. He's just a, a big bomb has been dropped on him. His entire family, himself, and everything he owns is going to be sold. And so his only reaction when he's face to face with what he had done and how that he had fallen short of the expectations given to him, the only thing that he could do was to fall on his face and beg and ask that king for forgiveness. Not necessarily for the forgiveness that we're going to talk about here soon, but he's actually asking the, the king to have patience on him. He says, oh, king, have patience upon me. Just give me some time, and if you give me a little bit of time, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to pay off this debt. Now, mind you, this could have never been paid off in an entire lifetime. The servant could have worked every day for the rest of his life, not spent a single penny on anything other than the debt that he owed to that king, and could not pay it off. And the king knew that. The king knew he, there's no way that this man, this servant, could pay this off ever in and of himself. And so therefore, we notice in verse number 27, the king has compassion upon this wicked servant. And he loosed him of his debt. Now, real quick, this king looks at him as he's on his face before him. He looks at him, and the Bible says he has compassion upon him because there is remorse. There is evidence of, uh, of noticing that he had sinned, that he had done something wrong, that he had failed to meet the expectations uh, given to him. And so this king has compassion and forgave him this debt. It's not that this king said, okay, well, you know, I'm going to take 20% of your income for the rest of your life. Uh, no, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. But there was no, no strings attached. Amen. He simply said, you're forgiven. I've wiped the slate completely clean. You're 100% forgiven. Let me tell you, this, this wicked servant, if he hadn't before, he has now known forgiveness. He's now known it. He knows what it looks like and he knows what it look, or feels like. He knows what it looks like in his own life. He knows how, how it feels to be given or forgiven so much. At the same time, he's been given an example of how to forgive as well. And you would think that it should be within this wicked servant to, to then want to show forgiveness as well because he's known it. Unfortunately, as the label that we give him, the wicked servant indicates, he does not do so. Very soon after, he gets up off of his knees, and as he's on his way back, he finds a fellow servant, somebody who is equal to him in status or maybe even under him in status. Regardless, he comes to this fellow servant, and he, he demands of that fellow servant to pay him what that fellow servant owes him, which was only 100 pence. Apparently, this one fellow servant owed this wicked, ser wicked servant 100 pence. And from what I understand, there's many sources that have said that that is equivalent to only $14 today. $14. Very, very minimal. And so this wicked servant says, oh, I, I, you're, you're gonna, you're, you need to pay me right now, bud. Listen, you owe me this money. It's been some time now. I've given you some time, and you need to pay me this money right here, right now. And he even takes him by the throat, the Bible says, and shakes him, telling him, pay me what thou owest. And so... That fellow servant, ironically, does the very same thing that the wicked servant had done in front of the king. And he falls before him on his face. And he begs him. He says, he says, just have some patience on me. If you just give me some time, I'll be able to pay off this debt that I owe you. And mind you, he could have. He could have easily paid off that debt. It's 100 pence, $14 worth in today's day and age. He could have easily paid that off. But nevertheless, as this fellow servant is before this wicked servant, he's on his face begging and asking for forgiveness. And this fellow or this wicked servant looks at him. He says no. And he casts him into prison until the debt could be paid. And apparently, this must have been something very out of the ordinary. Because as we see in verse number 29, the fellow, other fellow servants, I'm sorry, 31, so when his, the other fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. 
So this act was, was not very familiar. It was very unpredicted, as a matter of fact. It was something that, that these other fellow servants would not have expected. Especially, mind you, it's not like all the, the interaction between this wicked servant and this king was only known between those two. I guarantee you those other fellow servants knew what had happened between those two. And as those other fellow servants see that wicked servant casting that one fellow servant into prison, they're sorry. They're, they're almost saddened by this, as any of us would be. To know that somebody was, has been given, forgiven so much, a, such a great debt, and then turn around and cast somebody into prison for such a small little debt? It's sorry. It's saddening. And it doesn't take some take very long before the king gets wind of this. And the king comes up to that wicked servant and he, he lets him have it. He says, oh, that wicked servant, how could you do such a thing like this? I, I, I mean, don't you remember how that I have forgiven you 1,000 pence worth? And there's no way you could have paid that off in your entire life. Yet, re regardless, I forgave you of that debt. And you turn around to a fellow servant and you throw him into prison for just a mere 100 pence? Shouldn't you have had compassion on him as I have pity on you? And so this king throws him, this wicked servant, into the tormentors. <clears throat> a little bit different from different than prison. It's similar in the fact that you're, you're in prison and you are behind bars. But it's different in this fact that every once in a while, I can't, couldn't find it exactly if there was a particular timing today or whatever it may be. But there were times where a person or people would come into the, those uh, prison bars and torment those people that were in prison. So it was a little bit worse than just prison. It was a little more severe punishment than what he had, what that wicked servant had cast upon the fellow servant. And I want us to get this. The reason why this wicked servant was thrown into prison with the tormentors, it wasn't because he was negligent and that maybe he stole money. It wasn't that he just failed to do the work and the job that was required of him. No, that was not the case at all. The reason why he was thrown into prison the tormentors was because he failed to forgive after he had been forgiven so much. Amen. That's the main reason. And look, it doesn't take much for us to understand that this is exactly what Jesus is saying to Peter here. And, and notice what he says, how he concludes this in verse number 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, Peter, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Jesus is saying to Peter, look, my heavenly father is going to treat you the exact same way that this king treated the wicked servant. Because look, here's the thing, Peter. You have known forgiveness. You, there was a time where you understood that you have fallen short, that you owed a great debt, that you could have never paid off in an entire lifetime, Peter. You could have been good for the rest of your life, yet never even scratched the surface of paying this debt off. Yet regardless, Peter, because of me and what I've come to do for you, die on the cross for your sins, Peter, you know what forgiveness is. And it should be within you to want to show forgiveness as well. For other people, what they've done for you or done towards you and how they've wronged you or whatever whatever they've done. And no matter how many times they've done it, Peter, you should be willing and desirous of showing forgiveness. But, but Peter, if that's not motive enough, motivation enough, I just want to let you know right now, if you fail to do so, as is what is indicated here in this parable, there's going to be judgment and chastisement that falls upon you. If you fail to forgive, like you've been forgiven. And as we can see here, it, it, it's pretty clear. God has a way of, of exercising his chastisement in a little more severe way than what we're treating other people for what they've done towards us. See? So the application should be very, very simple, very clear for us today. I know that a number of people watching on live streams are, are have come to a point where they've they, they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They've accepted him as their personal savior. And I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that because there, there has come a time in every single person's life who knows Jesus Christ as their personal savior. There came a time where they recognized how that they had fallen short of God's standards and realizing, look, there's no way I could pay off this debt in my entire life. There's, I could not possibly work this off in and of myself. I'm too wicked. I'm too sinful. I'm not good enough to accept salvation, or I mean to, to earn salvation in and of myself, there's no way. It's only by what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And there came a time where like the wicked servant or even the fellow servant, you fell on your face before God and you said, God, forgive me. 
there's not, I, I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to offer you. I can't possibly earn this, this or pay off this debt in and of myself. I can't do it. God, I trust that what you've done on the cross to, for me was enough. And there was a time in your life where you knew and you've known forgiveness in a way that could have never been exemplified by any other person other than Jesus Christ. Amen. Only Jesus could offer such a great amount of forgiveness in your life, your life. I want to let you know right now, if you've known forgiveness and you look around in your life and you see what this person's doing in your life and you're so frustrated with it, you see this individual and you're so angered by them and you, you have a list. I'm telling you, we have a way of listing off people in our lives where we can remember every single thing that they've done wrong towards us. We have a way of holding on to anger and bitterness towards people. I want to let you know, right now, if you've known forgiveness and you're failing to show it, there's going to be some serious consequences that come from that. And because, look, here's the thing. Mo there should, wanting to forgive somebody after being forgiven so much should be motivation enough. It should be, this should be within us after we've accepted Jesus Christ, realizing how much of a, a, such a great amount of forgiveness has been extended towards us in our lives to want to then leave and see other people, despite what they've done wrong towards us, despite what they've said or, or done to us, whatever it may be, to look at them and say, you know, I forgive you. That's right. You might be saying, well, you know what, Brother Rice, you just, you don't have any idea what they've done to, to me. You don't, you don't know the amount of pain that they've caused me. There's no pain that a single person can cause you that we've not already caused Jesus when he was on the cross. Amen. Not at all. Jesus endured the pain and the agony of dying on the cross for our sins. There's nothing, you, can't, you cannot compare anything that anybody's ever done to you to what we've already <laughs> done, what we did to Jesus when he died on the cross for our sins. There's no way we could compare those two things. And so instead of focusing on, man, so-and-so said this about me and they stabbed me in the back. They didn't keep this promise over here. You know, they said this about me or, or man, you know, they, they, they're just so self-centered and so inconsiderate. And, man, it just seems like all they care about is themselves and they don't even care about me. Whatever it may be, whatever, whoever is doing you wrong, I want to let you know right now. The best thing to do, quit focusing on what they're doing towards you and focus on what Jesus did for you on the cross. Amen. Focus on the amount of forgiveness that you've received in your life. Don't focus on what people are doing towards you and how they've wronged you. And here's the saddening part. I guarantee you a number of you have heard messages along the lines of forgiveness. Many messages, as a matter of fact. But the saddening thing is that regardless of that, we will still act like the wicked servant and go on our way refusing to forgive other people. And I'm letting you know, here's the thing. It, it should be such, this, that, the fact that Jesus Christ has forgiven us so much in our lives, not even just at the moment of salvation, but think about what he forgives you each and every day. The little failures that you that you, that you have towards him and that you fail to accomplish obeying him on a daily basis, the little failures that on a daily basis he even forgives, yeah. that in and of itself should be motivation to look at the faults and the failures and the wrongdoings and the sins that people have, ex have done towards you and say, you know, I'm just going to forgive them. I'm not going to hold that over their head. That should be motivation enough. But if it's not, it should be motivation enough to see what happens in verse number 35, where that Jesus says, So will my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone. What that's simply saying is, God's not going to tolerate a child of God who lives a life of unforgiveness after they've received so much forgiveness. God's not going to tolerate that. And, and I want to let you know, God has a way of treating us worse than how we treat other people whenever they do us wrong. He has a way of doing that. I, I can't ex explain and point out exact ways how that happens, but he has a way of doing that. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I just this just doesn't make sense. Well, actually, it does. It makes 100% sense. 
it makes sense why God would be so saddened and sorry and angered and frustrated at a child, one of his children who has, who has received forgiveness in their life through the blood of Jesus Christ, yet turning around and it with anger and bitterness towards other individuals? There's no way God looks upon us and is pleased with something like that. There's no way God would allow us or would tolerate us living a life of unforgiveness after we've been forgiven so much. There's no way. It just doesn't even make sense why, why God would even tolerate such a thing like that. So if it's not motivation enough that you've been forgiven so much in your life, it should be motivation enough to think about the consequences, the chastisement that God would bring upon a child of God who lives a life of unforgiveness. Because it doesn't even give, it's not even a good testimony of who Jesus Christ is. If you live a life of unforgiveness, it's not a good testimony of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you in your life. So the invitation is very simple. Think about some people in your life. We, we all have people in our lives where we're frustrated and angered with. We have people that have wronged us, that have done us wrong, that have said things about us, have, has, has caused even pain and agony in our lives, and maybe on a repeated basis, over and over and over again. Think about those individuals. I want you to I want you to take time tonight to just spend time with God and asking Him, first of all, to forgive you for not offering forgiveness, to forgive you for being bitter and angry. Get that right with you and God. And in some cases, it might be appropriate to get that right with you and that other individual too. And that's not easy to do. I know it's not easy to do at all. It takes some humbling. It takes some time for you to get rid of some anger and bitterness and frustration. But I'll let you know, one of the sweetest things that you can experience in your Christian walk, in your life, is restoring a relationship with a brother in Christ because you decided to let go of some anger. And you, you decided to follow Christ's example of forgiveness. It's a wonderful thing. And it's exactly what God desires and expects from his children and for those of us in in this church as well it's exactly what he expects from us he expects us to know forgiveness but then to go on to the next step and show forgiveness if you've known forgiveness you need to show forgiveness as well at this time we're going to have Miss Amy play the piano and I know it might seem a little uncomfortable or difficult or whatever it may be, but I, I seriously encourage you, if the Lord's spoken to your heart, spend time with Him. Pray to Him and ask Him, Lord, forgive me for, for living a life of unforgiveness in my life. God, help me to get rid of this anger and this bitterness in my life. Lord, help me to let go of the frustrations and, and everything that's going on in my heart every time I see that individual. Lord, help me to just let go of those things to forgive like you've forgiven me. Help me to remember the, the death that you endured on the cross for me. I guarantee you at those moments, you'll realize there's nothing that a single person could do on this earth that could amount to the pain that Jesus Christ endured for you. That's right. Not at all.
even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And there's the standard. Even as Christ forgave you, he said, okay, I can forgive all of these, but oh, you've done this. I can't let that go. No, Jesus never did that, did he? He gave you a complete cleansing. And there's probably nothing worse in a believer's life than to have something in there that every time you just can't get free of it because about every time you think you're doing good, that thing, it comes up again. And uh, the only way to get rid of it is to forgive as Christ forgave you, and that's completely. Yeah. Completely. Amen. Well, I trust that the Lord has spoken to your heart this evening and uh, that he has uh, ministered to you through song and preaching. And uh, so we're going to, uh, I'm going to close this in prayer. And then Brother Craig's going to come after I finish praying. And he will uh, lead us again in our song, God Will Take Care of You. And we're going to sing that for a while. And hopefully we'll get to, get to it'll be a song will be in your heart this week. I hope that you'll remember that God is faithful. He will do so. He's able to do that. I trust if you have some need, that there's something we can do, or you just need somebody to pray, you uh, you can do this by Facebook. You can send a prayer request. You can also call uh, or text or something like that. And we'll we'll make sure to keep you in prayer this week. Let's be in prayer for each other and for our church family. All right. So let me let's go to the Lord, and Brother Craig will come and, and close us with song. Our Father tonight, uh, we're reminded again by this parable of the great love that you have to us and that you sent your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to suffer in a horrendous and awful way the punishment for the sin of this world, for my sin, for my acts of disobedience and blasphemy and all of the, the vile things that are true in my life. Jesus paid for them and Father, you've forgiven them in full based upon what he did. Uh, and Father, for my trust in him. So Lord, we ask you tonight, help us to be faithful, to search our hearts, that we not just get up from this tonight and, and go about our businesses just as we've done our duty. But I pray, Lord, you've spoken to us tonight. We'll deal with it if we have not yet. And we'll, we'll make a man. We'll do what we need to do, Lord, in this matter, that we can be right and be right with you and be right with our brethren. Uh, Lord, ask you please to be with our church families, our friends, and loved ones, and God, that you might uh, put your hand upon us. Be with our leaders tonight, President Trump, Vice President Pence, all of the folks that are kind of you know, on the front lines of this, our medical people, may you have your hand upon them. God, we ask and pray that you give wisdom to them, and that, Lord, this matter of quarantine and setting things apart and setting apart uh, gathering in groups and such as that, that, Lord, through this, we'd be able to get free of this virus here in our country, that it would do what their professionals are asking, that it would level out, and, God, that we could, we could see some victory in the United States of America and even, Lord, in the whole world, that you would do so. We again think of the Lees. May you keep your hand of protection upon them. Bless them as they minister there in Ecuador. And we ask these things tonight in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. We'll be singing that song, God Will Take Care of You. Let me also remind you as well, uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we'll do another live stream again. And look forward to gathering together by Facebook Live. Uh, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Let's sing that song, God Will Take Care of You.
dismissed here, let me encourage you, remind you, he's still on the throne. He chooses to use the likes of us, the likes of others. 